Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to this afternoon session. My name is Alyssa. I'm the director of the Artisan Grain Collaborative, and I'm going to help with a small amount of moderation here. But as I expect, we will find out these folks will just talk to each other because they know each other and are friends. So let's start with some introductions. We're talking about equipment. But before we do that, can folks say who they are, where they farm, and just some kind of bio farm information? Size, rotation, maybe? OK. My name is, uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, my name is Jake Willeret. Uh, I'm an organic farmer. And you can't hear me. Can you hear me in the back? Is that better? Yeah, OK. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Jake Willeret. I'm an organic farmer in uh, Malta, Illinois, which is in DeKalb County, uh, northern Illinois. Um, we have a three-year rotation of corn, soybeans, and oats. Um, Sixth generation family farmer, but I'm uh, second generation organic farmer. My dad started transitioning in the mid 90s. And uh, good thing, because it created an opportunity for me to be able to come back to the family farm and uh, work with my family. So it's been pretty great. Um, we have grown over the years, so I'm pretty privy to uh, having a tight budget and, uh, and buying into the business. And uh, yeah, here to help answer any questions you guys might have. Um, <clears throat> Adam, oh, that was horrible. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a, yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, Adam Roberts. Um, my family farmed for a long time, so kind of. Um, I think my grandpa, great grandfather, moved uh, over from Germany, bought some ground. Anyway. Um, my mom was part of the family, so I never really had any opportunity to farm, although I knew I wanted it. Um, trained under my uncle Ben uh, since 2005, started in high school. He went organic, started transitioning organic in 2001, 2002, uh, very successful at it. So I learned from him, never really learned how to conventional farm at all. Um, went off to ADM after college, came back, knew I wanted to farm, and uh, put together a kind of put together a, a binder of how I wanted to do it and ended up talking to some some landowners that were interested in, in having it done organic. So I, I started with technically first generation from from that standpoint. My balance sheet was essentially zero. I had I started with a two thousand two GMC Sierra and a ninety eight Harley Sportster. That was my balance sheet. Um, started with, fortunately, the, the saving grace was is I was able to start with um, a 250-acre organic piece, but the caveat was is that the guy before was kind of running out of steam, and so it was uh, pretty abused, pretty overrun with giant ragweed, and the fertility was really beat up. So that was kind of my starting piece. Um, and then I was able to start a seed business as well, North Fork Seed, so that kind of helped out as well to um, uh, grow with the farm. Ooh, this is fun. Oh. Uh, so yeah, uh, Roberts Family Organic Farms in North Fork Seed are kind of my, Put my two days. Asleep. Ah. Mm. Shut the lights off on us and just all right, everybody. That's enough. <laughs> Ross Wilkin. <clears throat> uh, my father Harold and I started going organic back in 2003, 2005. Um, and yeah, we started with 1,200 acres conventional and moved it all to organic over time, or 900 acres conventional. And um, we've been farming organic ever since. We currently farm 3,200 for last year and then picked up another 600 acres of transition for next year, which is a wonderful time for that. Woo. And uh, yeah, anyway, we've been having fun with organics ever since. Yeah, the mill. Uh, <coughs> yeah, and, and we have a flour mill that we mill our weed in mill our wheat into flour and sell it across the United States uh, in retail packaging mostly, but also to wholesale bakers as well. He's obviously very excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> On that topic, can you, each of you talk a little bit about the crops that you grow in a typical rotation? We're pretty much on the same page. I mean, we grow yeah. pretty much on a three-year rotation for the most part. So uh, they grow oats. So I, I do grow. I do grow wheat. Um, I do grow some some seed wheat uh, for my own varieties, and then also some oats. He's a little far north for. Yeah, I'm farther north, so the disease risk uh, for growing wheat tends to be uh, a little bit higher. But things have gotten better with varieties. There's some some farmers in the area in our area that are growing more wheat and seem like they're having better luck. But 
Uh, dad started growing oats, just 100% oats in that rotation probably six, seven years ago, and uh, it's just worked well for our operation. Uh, so that's, that's what we've been growing. Uh, and then with the oats, we typically grow a cover crop. So whether that would be interceding clover with that or uh, just planting just straight oats and then harvesting the oats, putting on fertility, and then putting a, a variety of species of uh, cover crops with, with that to hold the soil and hold the nitrogen in. So. We grow uh, mostly hard red winter wheat, honestly, in, uh, in central Illinois for our flour mill, uh, whereas as most people raise soft red winter wheat in central Illinois. And then we also do a couple hundred acres every year of hard red spring wheat, which is just super high protein, so for bread flowers. Um, but no one does that in central Illinois. It's probably for the best. Yeah. Probably for good <clears throat> reasons. Do you have anything else to say about what you grow? Um, corn and beans too, right? All yeah, of corn and soybeans. Um, no, I feel like we could probably just open up the floor to yeah, questions I think or we however you want to do it. No, I think we should do that. So if folks have initial thoughts on the topic of first equipment purchases, feel free to throw them out. But now that you have this context, maybe you all want to say a little bit to start about what equipment you bought sure. first. Sure. Um, yeah. Adam, why don't you start with that? Yeah. <clears throat> so. Because I, I truly started with zero equipment. Um, my first two, what, right or wrong, my first two purchases were um, an MX-285. It was cheap horsepower at the time. They're kind of a, they're kind of a, you know, nickel and dime tractor. It was a 2000, anyway. It was a nickel and dime tractor. It was cheap horsepower. I could get everything done I wanted done with it. I could field cultivate. I could plant. I could chisel plow in season work. It, it was good for that. And then I bought a buffalo cultivator. Uh, and a rotary hoe. So those were the, the three kind of critical pieces to any organic startup farm operations. You've got to be able to do your, your rotary hoeing and your buffalo cultivating uh, and a tractor to pull all that. If you have, my takeaway from that was is that if you look at, if you're trying to figure out where the best way to make money is with the little money you have, um, if you ever look at Iowa farm custom rates, they assign very little value to a tractor. So you spend a lot of money on a tractor and guidance, and it's worth like $6 an acre. Um, where like a buffalo cultivator, if you look at renting a tractor and a buffalo cultivator, it's like $18 or $20 an acre. So they assign a gob of value to that buffalo cultivator. It's a relatively cheap piece of equipment. So I guess the point I'm trying to say is if you have a good relationship with, say, a neighboring farmer, it makes sense to buy more of the equipment side of things and rent the tractor if you can. Uh, so that, that was my kind of my initial takeaway of, of start buying my own equipment. And it's, it's so tempting because as, say, a first gen, you don't see yourself as a farmer until you have a tractor and a combine. You know, that was my psychological thing. Where I didn't feel like a farmer unless I had that tractor and combine. So it was kind of maybe an irresponsible purchase up front. Um, that, that was kind of my, my thought on it. But that's assuming you have a good relationship with a neighbor that can rent you a farmer. Or rent you a farmer. Rent you a tractor. <laughs> also rent a farmer. That rent a farmer. That would, yeah, that would be. So let's just open it up to questions. I mean, we, uh, we have a variety of different tillage tools that we use uh, for managing weeds. Uh, but we don't have to limit ourselves at that. We can talk about just about everything and anything you guys want to ask questions about. And I think this room is fine if folks just want to call out for questions. But folks could also come up to the mic. Or if you want to raise So I farm since like 93, and I've been what I call conventional no-till. So I've got a real good planter, a real good drill, and a combine. Where do I go from here? I, I used to think that, that, that tillage was worse than chemicals. Now I'm pretty sure chemicals are worse than tillage. And, and I have picked up a cultivator, a rotary hoe, and another cultivator, a row crop, and I've got a wide sweep. And it's not a buffalo, but it's a land all. Are, are you going organic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Transition organic. Okay. Are you aiming to do no-till organic, or are you aiming to I don't do think that's possible. Okay. <laughs> sorry, Aaron. We're on the same page. It isn't. <clears throat> Just kidding. I'm sorry. I, I'm picking fights already. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I, what started this whole thing the last... Uh, um, I go on and on about how much I love my tine weeder. So if you want my opinion, if you have soybeans, get yourself a tine weeder above all else. So I've got a roller crimper I'd like to trade for a high-speed disc, if anybody has one. <laughs> Straight up. Um, on, I guess on Ross's point for the tine weeder, and we've, we've talked about this 
extensively before. The problem with the tine weeder is, is that when you embrace a tine weeder, it totally changes your, it totally changes everything you do. Uh, so for the longest time, I was trying to leave more and more stalk residue because I felt like the more stalk residue I had in the spring, the more it suppressed foxtail. All that rotting corn stalks, it's sent their, their grasses. I felt like there was an aliopathic effect. Um, and when you finally get a tine weeder and you use it the way it's supposed to be used, you realize that this is the best thing you can do, but it means chopping corn heads or chopping stalks, and then you're doing a disc pass, and then you're doing a disc chisel pass, and you basically need to wipe out all residue in the fall to be able to make sure that tine weeder makes it through. Because that's what I've done three years in a row now, is bought a tine weeder, didn't control my residue, was able to use it on 20% of my acres. But on the acres I did, grass, pigweed, lamb's quarters does not exist. And that's why I asked about the no-till, because if you're no-till, no, a tine weeder does you nothing. But yeah, I think we, we went years without a tine weeder and we just focus on the rotary hoe and the row crop cultivator. Um, the rotary hoe is a, is just a, a must. I mean, we can all agree on that. The tine weeder is an incredibly beneficial tool, but if it's not in your budget and you're weighing between a tine weeder and a rotary hoe, start with the rotary hoe. Agreed, but then immediately buy a tine weeder. <laughs> Buy a rotary hoe, but spend the money on good wheels. I think that's something that a lot of cheap farmers like to do, and I was caught in that trap too. Where it's like, you go to Mauer cheap cheap wheels, cheap wheel. Buy buy rotary hoe wheels. Big spoons, aggressive angle. You want good new wheels, and you want that spoon as big as possible. You want that, you, you know, it, it's incredibly important but, over the row. So a lot of times, what we'll do is we'll put new wheels over the row. I was, I was gonna say a frugal cheat is we put. New new wheels over top the row, and then just move our used ones to the in between. Just keep rotating them out because we don't care about in between the rows. Yeah. So we just rebuilt this cultivator. The wheels were down to about 18 inches, and they started at 21. And I found some cheap ones on the internet for 49 dollars a piece. Um, but have you noticed that John Deere wheels have a lot lot more of a curve to them? I, I'm, a, that, I'm a John Deere wheel guy. Yeah, but they're $109 a piece. So uh, you, it, okay. So la the last set of the last set of John Deere wheels I got um, four four or five months ago. I just wa whenever I'm in John Deere, I just talk to the parts manager and just say, Hey, if, how many John Deere wheels do you have on you? Oh, 30, 40, What if I buy them all? What kind of deal can you give me? They'll almost always work with you. The last set was 68 bucks five months ago. They they won't run from. Get a different John Deere dealer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, call around. They'll work. They'll work. Yeah. yeah. But even if you do, have, the point is, is you if you have to spend the hundred and three dollars, it's worth it. it you, it's so it's such an efficient tool because you're going, you're doing eighty acres an hour instead of seven with the tine weeder. So if you're trying to cross a lot of acres in a short amount of time, you just can't, you can't replace the rotary hoe. Tine weeder is kind of a luxury. Yeah, it's it's all about just sizing your residue. It can be frustrating. Yeah, right. Uh, since we're on rotary hoes. You're talking about like if you had a third link or something where you angle it back to get more aggressive, or what's your question? Oh, like a Lilliston effect where you're kind of running your rotary hill wheel. Are the bearings designed for that? I don't think so. I don't yeah, know. That's, that's seems, I don't know. That seems kind of risky on the yeah. integrity of the bearing. Fascinating. If you had a tapered bearing, I could see that, but but a, yeah. the straight bearing that come in. There are those other machines or those tools. Yeah, you can buy one. They're yellow and yeah, red, uh, mostly it's red. Got, it's kind of like a rake. Aero, Aerostar? I don't know. Einbach might have one. Luke, hey, yeah, talk to Luke. <laughs> There's a company out of El Paso that has something like that. Well, that, uh, El Paso, Illinois. I don't know what it's yeah, called. Yeah, but doing that to your own rotary hoe, I feel like that's going to be hard on the on the yeah. arms. The arms are pretty Terrible. weak. I mean, you can bend those pretty easy, and then also it'd be hard it's hard side loading those bearings. So I wouldn't recommend doing that, but do what you want. If it works, though, we haven't done it. If it works for you, yeah, exactly. Well, I've never done it. I just heard about it. Hmm. Okay, no, don't, no, do it. No, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, don't do it. We're pros at this. Don't do it. <laughs> We just saw it. Okay, there he is. This Talk guy. Okay, yeah. We're just going to start pawning you off on all the salesmen. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why we're here. <laughs> There's a guy for that. 
uh, yeah, I've never run that equipment, but if, if that is something you're, you're interested in, a more aggressive rotary hoe, it would, it would be more of a Lilliston style, where instead of an arm, I think they just have a shaft that goes through, and then you kind of independently adjust the, the depth of um, the individual unit on top of the row. But point being is, good rotary hoe wheels, uh, and put them right on top of the row, and just keep hitting it. I, and there's just not a more efficient tool. Some, sometimes we'll turn around and hit the same field same day, yeah. twice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Turn back around, snake backwards. I mean, really, it's just the hours on the on the tractor and, and the hours in the seat. And the the, the there's none of. Right. Yeah. The fuel they use is next to nothing. Ten tenth of a gallon an acre. Um, yeah. And you can put so many acres on those things before having to rebuild it. It's, mm -hmm. it's yeah. It's it's definitely an absolute must. It's important though that you're not. You're not using it when you see the weeds. It's 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 a it's a pre-emergent tool. Correct. So you're trying to when I the way I look at it is is you're trying to keep the ground fluffed up, and if it's fluffy and dry, nothing can really grow. The seed to soil content. Those little seeds like a lot of compaction. Um, so that's the way I see it as more of a, a, a pre-emergent tool. If you have the weeds already, now you're looking at an early cultivation or time weeding or something. In like. order to control weeds, not that I'm perfect by any means. But in order to control weeds, early is always the best. You know, cultivating should should be on a normal year be pretty mundane. Those early applications with the time leader and the rotary hoe is how you're going to get your crop ahead of the weeds. So that is like imperative to have good equipment early on. Early on to attack those weeds after planting. Every time you rotary hoe, that creates an event. Granted, you're fluffing it up but you're also stimulating a new flush when you do that. Every time you do an application and every time it rains, you're creating a new flush of weeds. So that's why we rotary hoe every so many days because when that next flush is just starting to take back off, go hit it again. I don't think you can rotary hoe too many times and I don't think that is what's gonna break your business. Rotary hoe often. Beans, I mean, for sure two times, maybe three. I mean, if it rains a bunch or you know, I, I don't know. Sorry, every I'm every year's different. Every situation is different. But you have to analyze every field on what it needs today. I'll rotary hoe beans eight eight times. Adam's not messing around. No, it's not. <laughs> I just if you're bored walking around in the spring, go rotary hoe something. That's how that's how yeah, I see yeah, it. If you can't find anything to do or you don't want to be in the house. Yeah, just yeah. rotary hoe. Rotary hoe. Yeah. <laughs> Most people say push yeah. or broom if you have nothing to do. No, it's, <laughs> Rotary hose is pretty hard to not just buy a new one. I, I grew up extremely frugal, just trying to buy used rotary hose all the time, and then ultimately I should have just bought new ones. It's, it's just a bar. I mean, you can rebuild whatever. Yeah, you definitely can. I think there's, there's merit to both. I mean, I, if you find a good used bar, you can easily just buy a Yetter kit and re, redo it. But if we're talking about equipment in general outside of the rotary hose. Oh. Um, oh. Like, when do you decide that it's more beneficial for uh, my operation to buy new versus used? Uh, Taking into consideration that uh, machinery is always depreciating, but the used things are being sold for a reason. J uh, Jake okay, and so I. That's a great question. Okay, when. when I guess the point is, is that when analyzing. The, the tough thing on a rotary. The tough thing about a rotary hoe. <laughs> There, I mean, there's two things you got to watch on a rotary hoe is the spring tension that holds the arms in the ground. Everything. Oh, what? He's talking about everything. New equipment in general versus used. used. Yeah, and what you're taking is come on. And I don't, I, oh. I'm a, I, I, I don't know. I like used. I like, I like used because. I, same. What it comes used out, or lightly used is ideal. It depends on your budget. And, uh, and it depends on the piece of machinery. Piece. If you find something that looks wore out, it's wore out. But if you can find that source the parts, find everything you need to rebuild it, and you feel like you can handle that with your time and your labor, whatever, whatever the case, used is always the best option. Got but it. if you have the budget for something new, you know you can spread it around and, and pick and choose what fits your operation best to have something new. Sp sp Good. Spend the new money on track. Uh, like spend the spend the on more the money on unit. Yeah, on the power. Yeah, the 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 equipment can be repaired. The cultivators are simple. Rotary hose are simple. And the, yeah, yeah, and the time, time, there's nothing to, yeah. there's really nothing to mess up on. In terms of the implements, 
look for used if you can find anything available. A lot of times when guys are buying new, it's just because whatever size that they want or whatever specifically they want, they just can't find it. So then they got to go buy a new one and it just is what it is. The, but a Good example, like Buffalo Row cultivators, 16 rows are hard to find. Don't get me wrong. And so some of it's market timing, but you can buy a used one for 30 to 50 grand on an, yeah, 30 to 50. It used to be just it used to be 15 to 30. But anyway, point being is, is you can buy a used one for, let's say, 30 grand that needs maybe five grand in work. Um, and then versus spending 110 for a new one, it's understandable. In that route, you should definitely go used, especially if you're getting started. Um, and especially big, heavy pieces like cultivators, usually it's some bushings and some bearings, and you basically have a brand new machine again. It just seems irresponsible to buy new on in, in something like that. Yeah, focus so. on the tractors, the power unit, and make sure that is in good shape. If you have a tractor that's breaking <laughs> down, you can't get anything done. So that's where I would wisely spend the money. In organics, we need so much labor that I tend to go often on the used route and work on it you know, all winter long because we have so much labor. I need so much labor for eight months out of the year that, that having five to 10 year old equipment gives my guys something to do all winter. So the so four months of winter, we're fixing that equipment versus biting the bullet up front and buying everything brand new and then having nothing to do in the winter because nothing's wore out. Yeah. Going back to Rotary Coast, do you guys have a philosophy of like height of crop of when you're like, I'm done. I'm not gonna use the Rotary Coast anymore. Just when it seems like it's not, it's not the height of the crop, it's the height of the weeds. So if you're not, if you're not terminating, if you're not doing, you know, the rotary hoe is only going to get really the really, really tiny, like the seed, like seedlings. You rotary hoe an eight inch corn? No. Okay. Like what's the max height that you'll... But that's what he's trying it's, to say. It depends. It doesn't matter on the crop. It matters on the weeds. So yeah. once the weeds are big enough, like you have to switch to a different tool. Yeah. If, if, right? if, if the escapes that made it through, which there will be, are now two to three inches, well, now our timing's running out on can we cover them up still? And then that's when you get into your high residue, yeah. you know, cultivators where you're trying to throw dirt on top of the row. Yeah. I just know some guys like, that I'm talking to, um, they immediately say, oh, they don't like to throw your row on corn. They, they just, once it's up, they're only pre-emergence type of mentality wow. with the hoe. And I just was curious how you guys approach it. We'll hoe, we'll hoe cor corn twice. We'll pre-emerge, we'll post-emerge. Yeah. I mean, it, it just depends on how bad you're beating it up. I mean, there's certain stages in corn that you need to stay away from it, that it's more vulnerable, that you're gonna you know, thin your population way too far down. Rotary hoeing corn second pass is absolutely my least favorite job because it is very stressful. You don't know if you're screwing it up or not. Yeah, exactly. You're throwing a bunch of dirt on a corn plant that's at V2, and then you're burying it, and you're like, oh, I hope you come through that. <laughs> but it's part of the deal. You have to take care of the weeds first. Yeah. Weeds come first. What about compaction if you run over the ground? Same rows with the back tires, front tires. If you're running over a uh, uh, rotary horn four, I, five, six times. I, honestly, I, I think. I, I think in organics, I mean, 24 <laughs> row if you can, but obviously that's a very minute faction but i think 16 row should be the home run swing everyone should just have 40 foot equipment and just stay on those tram lines and that's basically the most you can do to minimize it i like i like the idea track tractors we personally farm 40 miles north and basically 40 miles south and so it doesn't make sense for us to do all that road wear uh with tracks otherwise i if i was close to home if everything was nice and 10 mile radius, absolutely. I would have all track tractors. In terms of Kim. That's a nice concept if you got a huge farm. The, a lot of organic farms that we have in my area are small ones. We don't have 40 miles. Okay. Well, you're also what, running lighter equipment though, too. Yeah, where, where, what area are you from? I'm around the Butte County. Okay. A lot of hills, a lot of contours. You don't probably have 18 year old. I, then. So then Eight, eight rows without duels on your tractors. I mean, I grew up using 4620s with eight row row cultivators behind them, and that's your controlled traffic. You just try and keep it minimized to those two tracks. And it, it's just part of farming organic. Uh, you know, if you're if you're doing tillage versus the no till situation, like you're going to have your tram lines. You're going to have where you drive the tractor through. But if you set your cultivator right, you know, if you have a heavier enough cultivator, you can try and pull a lot of that compaction out behind the tires when you're running through there with the grow crop cultivator. Um, 
inline it's, ripping uh, it, in the fall? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's certain things. Yeah, we, we run a, a, a chisel plow or a disc ripper in the fall to try and pull out a lot of that compaction. He, it's something that I'm, I don't love. Like, I, 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 I see what you're trying to say, and I, I don't <coughs> love that part of it. We make a lot of passes through the field, and sometimes you have to go through a field that might be a little bit marginal in conditions and spots. But unfortunately, we, the, the weeds come first, and that's just the mentality. You have to go take care of the weeds, or you're not going to take care of your crop. Uh, and honestly, probably most of your damage is done on your first cultivator, your first field cultivator pass for the spring, and then planting. I mean, you've kind of already set the stage anyway, uh, is the way I see it. Uh, I don't necessarily know that multiple passes post emergent seem to make that big a difference. Brad? I, How about um, sizing your uh, equipment? Um, so, uh, so I currently at 600 and I had 12 row equipment, easily get done with that. Uh, very simple with a single 30 foot rotary hoe. Um, I did finally work myself up to a couple of 12 row buffaloes just because it seems like our weather pattern is a little bit more, um, finicky. You know, you get smaller windows, it seems. Um, so I think it's a little on the oversized. Probably at the, but it's never. I don't think you can ever oversize. You're never going to be mad at yourself and be like, "Why do I have so many cultivators?" There's going to be a day or a year that you need everything to run. So it depends what's in your budget. But um, if you're running 12 row everything, it, I mean, you it, can get by with one. It depends on your labor too. But one two is yeah. one's good. Two's better. And I, I, but to answer your question, I also have a neighbor and a seed customer that is. There was 1,200 acres, and he was. 12, he's still 12 row equipment. Uh, he did move up to a 24 row planter, but his, his, everything else is still, and maybe a 24 row rotary hoe. No, 24 row tine weeder. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was, he was, as of two years ago, I mean, he was running everything on 12 row. He had a high speed 12 row planter, a uh, couple of 12 row rotary hoes, couple 12 row buffaloes, and he was getting across everything. It depends how many hours you want to work too. He, he so should he should have switched over to sixteen row. I badgered him about that about four years ago. Russell loves I, I love sixteen row. At the end of the day, we, we can't all have twenty four row equipment, um, and sixteen row is just narrower transport, but still wide. Um, I know that you get into some narrow roads in Indiana, and even sixteen row is really daunting to go down the road. But if you're in a flat area. I would start as close as soon as you can with 16 because it's not that much more expensive and you're just getting done 33% more over 12 row. So I would make the jump from eight to 16 instead of eight to 12 because I think all of the equipment's very similar priced. Like how much more is it? You go to 60. Right. I'm, That's astronomical. Yeah. You're gonna spend 20% more for a 16 row row cultivator and accomplish 33% more every minute you're driving it. Uh, it's more than 33% because you have to figure less turns, uh, everything. So yeah, you, you gain a lot of efficiency out of yep. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I did. So just recently I've moved from 12 to 16. Um, and uh, yeah, it seems like the move. I, I think there's a lot of Guys, that's a, that's a good thing we should probably say is you're on 12s and moving to 16. Mm -hmm. You're at 16. I'm on, I, I'm on 16 and don't feel like I can go to 24 ever just from right. logistics. Otherwise, I'm, I would love to. I'm on 24, so 60 foot equipment for all of my applications. He's like a 10 mile radius. So yeah, I'm pretty close to the farm, so I'm pretty fortunate. So moving those around are a little dicey, but yeah. Anybody else got any? Thing? Do you use flamers? Flamers? Yeah, I, I have a flamer, uh, Lukey torches. Uh, um, yeah, I've had it. Uh, it's one of those things that I strictly use it in corn. I'm mostly using it on corn that's, well, it depends on, if mother nature, if it rains right after you plant and it rains ever since, uh, then sometimes you'll be out there flaming some pretty small corn just trying to rescue treatment, which I don't love. Sometimes in organics, you're better off take a field cultivator out there and take your corn down. That's, if, if your corn's this tall and all of your weeds are this tall, just start over. Um, but sometimes you'll use a flamer in certain situations. Do you wanna talk about the rescue tools? I, I think what he's trying to say is that it's a, it's a pretty luxurious item that's not really necessary. I like it, but yeah. it, it's it's a little luxurious. Oh, 
necessities versus the uh, yeah necessities versus like the rescue tools that aren't necessary for every farm. I mean, a flamer and a zapper are the two things that are a little bit of rescue tools that are a little bit of a luxury. Um, as always, if there's someone in your area that you have access to one, like that's nice. It's a nice thing to partner with people on because it's not necessarily a tool you have to use every year. Um, but when you do need it, I mean, when you need it on corn, it's <clears throat> we call it a luxury, but also it's 30 grand for a 16 row homemade flamer, basically. <laughs> if you're talking about a f 500 acres of corn you need to do every year in a rescue situation, it will so pay for itself. So yes, it's a rescue, but in organics, there's always like a, you want to have access to access to to those rescue tools because otherwise you're just you're screwed like so i don't know so, so, sometimes so rescue but you don't need it every year i think i think the issue is is that sometimes rescue can be the worst choice in organic and sometimes st most of the time start over needs to be the yep, the forefront that should, be, that should be the first thing you do i mean when in doubt get the field cultivator out and call your crop insurance agent yeah. And when it rains till July 15th straight, just cry? Yeah. I don't know that a yeah, flame is saving you at that point. That's, that's what right. I do. <laughs> yeah, so, I, yeah, Jake brought up necessities versus luxuries. If, if, if you were to ask me what I would spend my money on, which I told you would be a field cultivator, a rotary hoe, and a buffalo cultivator. Um, that's going get, to get you at least where you need to be. That, that can make anybody... Uh, a mildly successful and organic farm. You gotta hire somebody to harvest it, hire a neighbor to maybe chisel it, whatever, but having a good tractor, field cultivator, planter if you can, and rotary home cultivator are the, are the biggies. Yeah. What else? Single sweet versus uh, multi sweet cultivator. Jake, you've had some experience recently yeah, with multi sweet. Um, single sweep for sure I prefer I think that having uh, for the soil types that I have we have heavier soils um, the single sweep is is more aggressive uh, it's gonna sink in better I love how the dirt will roll off mm -hmm. uh, and, and pile up into the row um, when you're running a single sweep it can handle any type of residue any type of residue uh, having a cutting disc in front is is important um, to chop anything in its path. Uh, the multiple sweep units, they work good if the residue isn't too heavy. It's another one of those things, you know, if you have tine wieners, then it's not really gonna be an issue because you've already sized all of your socks. But um, they do a good job. I mean, like you have to do what works best for your farm, but the more sweeps you have between those rows, the more trash it's likely gonna plug up and you're gonna be swearing a lot. We, we got started in organics with a classic three sweep John Deere 845, super cheap. Uh, Klaus Martins, he spoke earlier, you know, I remember seeing him 20 years ago and he had that, he had a picture of the Ford with the front mount row cultivator on it. We started with a 4020 and a, a thousand dollar front mount row cultivator that would fold around eight rows at a time. And that stuff definitely works if, if that's what's in the budget. Um, a good set of rolling shields on that and a three sweep cultivator works. But at the end of the day, definitely we've all gone to single sweeps from a, they seem to have more finesse. They'll roll that dirt a little better uh, right up next to the row. And that's the key is, is to just keep stacking a little bit of dirt. And I think, <clears throat> so this year we, and I assume everybody was this way, we were pretty dry from, um, you know, essentially mid April to late June. And I think what that did was it pushed a lot of germination of small seed. We were basically just moving weed seed around the head and germinated all spring long. And then all of a sudden your beans are this tall and you have, we caught a bunch of rain and now you have grass that was say two inches tall, two, three inches tall. And with a, with a single sweep, especially a buffalo where you can pitch the sweeps as much as you need, I was able to come through and cover up with, a, with an already built up ridge with grass on top of it this way, I was able to throw even more dirt and bury 99% of that grass that had germinated late. With a multi-sweep, that's just not a, it's not an option. Adam has taught me, especially with big beans, you like, actually both of these guys have taught me, you really can't throw too much dirt. It's okay if you're burying more of those bottom leaves on that soybean plant. Mound it up, attack the weeds. It's a pain in the fall. Those yeah. giant ridges are a pain in the fall. Yeah, but it's rough. It's worth it. But it is worth it. What else? There were a few over here we missed. Yeah. Adam, I have one for you, but also your neighbors can speak to their experience. 
Okay. No, they can't. I got this. <laughs> just mean. <laughs> No, I, I did. I, my, my first purchase, my three first purchases were a rigid 30-foot John Deere rotary hoe, an MX-285 uh, with 4,500 hours on it, and a uh, wore-out 12-row uh, buffalo. Yeah, I think I think that, it, and it's something that everybody has to wrestle with right now. Is that, yeah, having cheap equipment gets you by, but it also probably costs you. It costs you yield at at the end of the day. I it, it just, you know, here I was trying to run wore out rotary hill rotary hill wheels. And, yeah, field elevator for sure. And so, okay, that's another good point. Yeah, had a field elevator my second year. Well, bought what I could afford. It was a Case forty three hundred. Poor design. And that what they do is they have a single bushing that eats out the shank. And so I was field cultivating in 2019, and obviously everybody knows that spring where we couldn't get in the field for two months. Weeds are this tall, and you could watch the shanks on my field cultivator literally bend out of the way of the weeds, and they're just moving around <laughs> like this. And that cost me a gob of money because I, you know, I just started the year with weeds that were this tall that I didn't get out. And that was another year I should have hit the reset button, but it was such a scary year. We got our crop in and we just rolled with it. And for somebody who could have rolled in with a nice tight field elevator, wouldn't have had those issues. Um, and so yeah, cheap, that's the issue. It's kind of this, and that's something I dealt with is I, an, another conundrum is, is, okay, you don't have money for, and it's this thing, you don't have money for manure. Okay, well, now that I don't have as much manure down, I don't get good of yields, as good of yields. And so now I don't have yields, now I don't have any money to put in manure. And it's just this kind of, same thing with the equipment, okay? The equipment costs me money. Now I don't have money to put back into my equipment, which continues to cost me money. And so, yeah, it... it Can I build on that? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Like Adam said, I think uh, the field cultivator should be a very, very high priority of having a good tool. Because that is setting the stage for the entire year. If you have a field cultivator that is pretty wore out or needs rebuilt or needs new sweeps, I mean, we, we do not mess around. If a sweep is starting to wear down or starting to look a little thin, we swap it out because, you know, we're organic farmers. We don't have sprayers, but that's pretty much your sprayer. That is what's terminating all of the weeds before you stick your seed in the ground. It's your last sure thing. Yeah, because there's nothing more disgusting then field cultivating, planting, and then you're walking around your field right after you plant it, or you know, you're checking to see if you should go rotary hoe yet, and you're seeing weeds this tall. And you're like, what happened? <laughs> that's frustrating, because that's, that's what's terminating everything. So if you have some wore out equipment, do it twice. Do it at two different hard angles. You know, do what's best for your farm, but uh, yeah, that's the difference. You're setting the stage for the year. And go deep, work it deep. Big believer in that. So what kind of row rows you guys are, or not row row, what kind of vehicle rows you recommend? I like soil finishers, actually. Oh, God. Ah. <laughs> the only difference Ross, is, the that's enough. The only difference is the, is, the cut, is the discs up front. And all that's doing is the size of the residue just a little bit more for the tine weeder that I'm in love with. If you don't drink that Kool-Aid. Um, Doesn't matter. I, I would recommend, uh, I, I think that the DMI design, or the, you know, soon become Case H right after that, those field cultivators are really, really good. Those mid or you uh, know Tiger Mate two, yep, Tiger yep, Mate two hundred, yeah, two hundred. Yeah, they're, 200, yeah. they're, they're that, pretty. They're not that expensive these yeah. days. But if if just you're a looking at start at a tight budget, the the, the TM two hundreds are are a good field cultivator that run pretty well. I've recently moved to John Deere's just because that's the way our farm was going. But and those work really, really well. We have some newer Deere twenty two thirties, but the case ones we ran forever, and we've had good luck. Oh, we got a question back here. Yeah, uh, you guys talk about referring by like, used equipment uh, to begin with. Have you guys ever built your own pieces of equipment as well? Like, built? Custom built? Uh, my dad built a flamer. We, we've, That's about it. Uh, it's pretty common to build a, to put a Gandy box on a sprayer frame and put on clover. So there's, yeah. 
He's done it. He's done it. We've I've have done it. we've had friends that have put some things together. It just depends yeah. at how handy you are in the shop. I mean, you, you're limited by your own creativity when it comes to that. If you can in, build in, it in yourself. In terms, when he says Gandhi Uni, talking about a because I didn't know this either. It was just forced air. Oh, it, sorry. It, it blows out through tubes and then hits a little pan and. So instead of spinners spreading clover on top of wheat, you're putting it on 30-inch bands where it just hits a little pan, spreads out. Very controllable. Um, Costs five grand to make, and it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Yeah. Find your used stuff on Marketplace, put it together. Uh, if you're spreading clover. Daily bread machine is where I got my Gandhi Valmar unit. They, they deal in used units. And you can put those stuff. Gandhi you know, units on oh, like I, any tillage tool I, and, and I, kind of custom do, make it however you want if you're looking to do like cover crop seeding, but I don't know why we're... To, to that regard, like we just got an 875 disc ripper and I wanted to work in chick manure with that, work down a red clover cover crop, but then also put out an additional uh, cover crop. And so we're putting oats on with our big disc ripper we're going in, we're tearing out the red clover, working in chick manure, and then we're spreading oats back on top of the ground as a, you know, additional help. Oh, it's, there's nothing better than, yeah. For seeding, for frost seeding clover, using a Gandhi type of box or a Valmar that has every 30 inch drops, it's just, Loves what he loves. Oh my goodness! I, I grew up with a spinner spreader, and it just drove me bonkers. And now it's just a picket fence. Yep. So this is for Adam or anybody who wants to answer. So you started, you had your cultivator. Maybe second year you got a field cultivator. You got, you know, all of that. Then what? Like, did you like if you have your neighbor that maybe you're borrowing a tractor from? What did you do next? Did you get some stuff for harvest that somebody else harvest? Like, what if that? So <clears throat> I was kind of forced into buying a harvester. I was working with my uncle and renting his equipment, and kind of around the same time, I had started picking up some acres uh, as well, growing the operation. And at some point, he just said, uh, "Look, it's probably about time to get your own harvester." Um, started with a 9510 John Deere. Uh, it's a straw walker machine. You can there are dime a dozen. You can buy them for nothing. Um, but again, and, and that's, I would recommend that solely in an instance where you have no other option. Because the thing I always thought of is, okay, I have this 30-year-old machine. What is that costing me to run? Because, okay, so fine. Let's say you get charged the premium custom rent for a guy to bring his combine and knock it out, you don't lift a finger, $45 an acre or something like that. It seems outrageous. But if you start looking at the price of an organic soybean, let's say I'm not paying attention, I don't know what I'm doing, or my machine's wore out, uh, I throw you know, three bushel out the back, he throws one bushel out the back, something like that. Okay, well that two bushel at $23, $25, that just paid for his custom rent. So. Har harvesters are last to buy if you can get by with sharing that with somebody. And they're so high wear and they actually depreciate, whereas a lot of other things in ag right now hold their value. And there's, you need ways to haul the grain, so when you hire the custom harvesting done, they, they need more labor. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a hire lot. it out as long as you can is what I learned. And that's from a guy who had to have a combine. I had to prove to everybody that I was a farmer. And then once I had it, I thought, why didn't I just keep paying somebody to do this? Andrew? Oh yeah, sorry. So, I was gonna lead with that. Okay. I I would not farm organically without GPS. Correct. Like yeah, so I, I quit. All three of us are. Whoa, it's on. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> he came up here and turned it on. Is that what my voice sounds like? All three of us are, are running RTK. Yeah. And, uh, and oh, so to answer your question, yes. Uh, no money to my name. Bought an MX285. It immediately stuck fifteen thousand worth of GPS on it. The most irresponsible purchase ever. I would not change a thing about what I did. And you can find used setups and GPS these days pretty reasonable. So whatever you have to do, use GPS. It just makes it, you don't have to have integrated valves anymore. They got really cool steering wheel monitor, you know, motors that you know you can just keep everything external. It allows you to move it around to multiple equipment. So instead of having to have you know, guidance in every single vehicle you have. Now it's like, well, I'm only one guy. I'm only ever going to use it in one tractor. So now it's like, well, I got three pieces of equipment. I can move that steering wheel motor, and I'll, I just have to have different harnesses so I can move that to my combine. And stuff. Yeah, you know, and so that's, that's how I feel. Yeah, because there's also something to be said about exhaustion, and you start making bad decisions when you're 
you know, you're yeah. constantly doing this. Or you're, you're looking for ex- oh, you're oh. just exhausted trying to drive. Damn. Jeff. I'm the simplest. I just run RTK with a mounted planter, and I just follow it with lock solid row cultivators. No, no adjustment hitches at all. They're flat. And we are very flat ground. Agreed. So there's there's two there's two kind of methods, and, and Jake's the exact opposite of both of us. There's two methods for. Uh, and I'm gonna to continue to say buffalo cultivating. What I mean is single sweep high red <coughs> cultivating. Now uh, they have cutaway discs that, that you can kind of cut away right next to the row, and then the single sweep is for throwing dirt. There's, there's two styles of thinking. It's um, do I wanna be the guy that tries to cut as physically close to the row as I can to wipe, to just cut all those weeds away. And there's my style of, okay, try to control as many weeds early on as you can and then focus on throwing dirt, mounding dirt up on top of the row as best you can. And if you're, if you're that style, you can get away with just a solid mounted hitch. Your cutaways are four and a half inches on either side of the row. They're, they're really an afterthought. I just care about perfectly throwing dirt on top of the row so that I'm covering weeds up, not knocking my crop over. He's a little different. Yeah, Jeff and I are actually neighbors. So Jeff and I pretty much run uh, steering hitches on our row crop cultivators because our ground rolls a little bit more. Uh, so we have to, you know, we like to run as tight as we can and as true as we can, uh, meaning that cultivator row unit, you know, side by side, that row is the same distance between every, each one of those rows to do the best job possible. If you start getting off one way or the other, you're going to start leaving weeds on this side or this side. So you want that row crop cultivator staying perfect, the row unit's perfectly centered with the row. Uh, otherwise you're not going to do the best job possible and you may have stragglers out there that get by because... When, the, when the, we go through a switchback, you know, like you got a draw coming through the field and you're coming back out, you want that thing to stay tight. So we have to use uh, uh, steering hitches, three-point mount steering hitches under cultivators. How, he also cuts dramatically closer, too. So yeah. when my disc killers are, say, nine inches apart, his are five inches apart. Yeah, I still think ours are closer to five, so I don't, but everyone measures a little different. <laughs> I don't have a mounted planner. <laughs> You don't. You did this year. I did, but I didn't plant most of them. Oh, okay. Way. All right. So he's not a mounted. Never mind. He owned a mounted planter, but he didn't For use it. For a minute. It. Yeah. <laughs> Do we? We're flat. You know, We're flat and square. The three of us are. Yeah. We're fortunate. Which means we have some. When Mother Nature sends five-inch rains, it gets really sad. But it's really nice for row cultivating. Angie. Ooh, that's a Jake question. It's, We're it's, square fields as well. It is insane. <laughs> um, point rows. Before the Einbach. Yeah, before the Einbach, uh, my dad drove around in an old 806 with a six-row cultivator and went cleaning up behind us, which was like the nicest thing ever. Because we'd just <laughs> leave and be like, it's over there. Go ahead and handle that. But uh, if you're running, you know, bigger, if you're running 12-row equipment, you can easily fold up. And, it, you know, point rows are frustrating because they take forever, especially if you're trying to plant, you know, every last acre of that field. Um, you can have, you're going to have to move over a lot. 12 rows, easy to fold, fold up and handle your point rows. Uh, when you start to get to 16, do you, do, do you fold up and do them with your 16? I don't plant point rows. Okay, there's also that option. You can plan for your field with your border strips mm-hmm. or plant, you know, planting more grass in the field to try and end up just perfect throughout the field. That's an option too. We don't always have that option, you know, where, yeah. where I'm from. Uh, there's a lot. Yeah, right. yeah, we have waterways, different. we have Very open different. ditches that go through, we have roads that curve, you know, we have all different situations. Um, fortunately, we, you know, we, we were able to buy a row crop cultivator with suction control, so that's been huge. Um, and, and when it senses where it, the row crop cultivator's already been, based on the GPS map, it'll just start picking up row units as you're going through there. So that's a really, really nice feature. Uh, but uh, if I were just starting out, you know, if you're running 12-row equipment, you can handle the point rows yourself. If you're running bigger equipment, I would start looking at an alternative options, like a smaller cultivator that you can go back through and clean up. Uh, waterways, too. Um, you know, if you're running a 12 row buffalo plowing, you know, if you've got a waterway at an angle going through there, plowing into that waterway, if that 12 row can be really destructive to that grass and you might not want to do that. Uh, so buying a smaller cultivator to kind of go through there, you're going to be less destructive to the grass if the machine is half the size. 
So it's tedious and it's not always fun, but it's part of the job. So something else you can do that I that I did around waterways was uh, do like a twenty whatever size drill you have. Just plant an oat or some sort of buffer along there. Um, plow into that and plow into that instead of your waterway. But again, lost acres. I, things are tight. I get it. Um, you want to maximize as much as you can, yeah. but it's just if you're doing that, that's going to require more management. Yeah. What else? Ross, what kind of time do you use? I have an Einbach, uh, pretty similar to a Hotzenbeckler, uh, and I think Trefflers are very nice. Uh, I started with Einbachs. They're very nice. <laughs> They're very nice. Uh, I started with a Einbach way back in the day. Uh, we got it for spring wheat, sat in the corner of my shed for five years, uh, didn't use it, and then like three, four years ago, got it out and fell in love. And it really mad at myself for not using it uh, in that time. Bought a second Einbach, um, looking at buying a third, considering a Treffler just to try it out. Well, I think you, you don't necessarily need a Treffler. I think they're 30% more expensive, but also maybe 30% better, maybe? So I'd like to try and compare, but I really can't speak to that. But your ground's flatter. Yeah, everything's flat, so contouring-wise, probably don't need it, but. Yes. Uh, how is, wh wh are, are you working with flat ground or rolling ground? Completely flat. Like, okay, then, then yeah, you'd be fine. Low, low residue, like, yeah. okay. Yeah, 100%. Well, um, and you can find used ones. Like, tine weeders are one of those things that they're unique that sometimes the used market's pretty decent. If Norm you can find them. If you can That's find in your them. your area. It's one of those things that in organics, it's best if you have a horizon, if you have a budget for what you want in a 12 month horizon and you just keep your eyes on it. Because it's one of those things that, yeah, if you look up Buffalo row cultivators right now on the market, you know, Adam just went to buy one and there was basically one in the United States for sale. Like there's just outside of new ones. And so if you want used at a good value, they come on the market, but not all the time. So you gotta have patience and you gotta have time to be able to source that out. I have a tine weeder from like 1950 that I'm imagining yours being. So if it was that, then probably go to a 30 foot newer Technology's one. Changed. What, the, the, the hydraulic downforce, yeah, definitely get hydraulic downforce. The tines, the tine angles have changed too. Just like my yeah, dad used to have yeah. one that was straight tines. It was essentially just a harrow. Oh geez. And it did a horrible job. Yeah. And then so when the whole tine weeder craze came out like what five six years ago, and everybody was like, you gotta buy a tine weeder. My dad was like, absolutely not. I tried this, it does not work, we're not doing it. But technology has changed so much with these things and they're so much more effective with the newer models. So it might be something that I would look into. Are you on a set wheel track? <laughs> are, are you on a set wheel track? What's your planter width? Okay. What, what would that be times two? I'm confused. So that'd be tw 24 foot, so 48 foot would be 44 double. 44 feet. 44 feet would be yeah. your. We're 30 inch guys and we don't know how to do math right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> 44 feet, okay. Basically set up what sugar beets are yeah. for uh, soybeans. So I, I would just, whatever, I would go with a time weeder width that's double your, your wheel track so that you can still stay on your wheel tracks yeah. every other pass. Okay. If your 22 foot passes, get 44 foot width. Hopefully they make that. Yeah, I, my philosophy is stay on a wheel track at all time, if possible. To minimize your compaction. Controlled traffic is a real thing. Yes. Yeah. Tram lines. We've got a couple minutes left, and just want to note that we have acknowledged this has been more of a black ground oriented conversation. So if anyone who is not quite as horizontally gifted, maybe, wants to chime in with your so horizontal. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Not vertically, though. No. <laughs> We're lucky. Any other questions? 
You can ask us anything that's outside of this too. Or we're, we're... I'm just curious if you can ask the crowd, like how many people are transitioning now? Or... Yeah, is everyone organic? What... Yeah, raise your hand if you are uh, currently transitioning. With nothing certified. Okay. What if you're all certified? Yeah, raise your hand if you are certified organic or you have some acres certified organic. Okay. Okay, good. And the other 20% lost? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, broken. learning, yeah. Just hanging out. Hoping to transition, okay. Yeah. It's a tough one. Any suggestion on no-till drills? John Deere makes a pretty good drill. Um, Great Plains as well. Yeah. I just have a John Deere, uh, it's an 1890 is the drilling attachment itself, but just a classic John Deere no-till drill. And... That's going to probably be the most abundant on the Marcus place. Too. Yeah. I th uh, and I think a lot of times you can get away with just a normal drill and no-till situations depending on what you're after. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think, yeah. I think you, you can. can you can no-till with a conventional drill if you have hydraulic downforce and you're able to turn it up high enough. Uh, what, what do higher elements anything or what do you look back on? That's a good question. I think the key with hiring out is an organics timing is everything. So the first question is, if I could hire out all of organics at, at U of I custom rates and they would do everything perfectly, yeah, I'd never farm a day in my life, right? Like it would be super easy. Be in Florida. Right, I'd be in Florida and I'd just hire someone because that would be easy, but that's not the world we live in. So I think a lot of it is what can you hire out in that timely manner a lot of that's normally harvesting where your window's pretty wide open and that's where you just want to own your own row cultivator because you have narrow windows of time and it's pretty hard to get someone to show up and 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 do it when you need it. So may, harvest is basically the main thing. I mean, maybe you could hire out planting. Plan, planting for plant, sure. Uh, plant. Fertility, like handling your fertility, that's yeah. a good thing to hire out. Yeah, we hire, yeah, all the chicken manure spreading you can. Yeah, um, or, or. But planting, Planting's another one of those things that you take for granted. We went from uh, spring downforce to we had airbags for a two for two years, and then we went to hydraulic downforce, and it's kind of like <laughs> GPS where hydraulic downforce does such a good job that if you can hire someone to, if you can't afford it, it's probably worth paying someone to do that good of a job with a really good utensil. Because it's going to stay lighter. You know, hydraulic downforce, what it's doing is it's, it's keeping an even pressure across the field and you're limiting your compaction over the row, which in turn will limit the amount of foxtail you're going to have coming up in the row. What I pay attention to is like a, a cost ratio to custom rents. So uh, you can get a lot of money wrapped up in a good planner. And if you pay somebody, to, uh, I think the average custom rent for a guy to come in and plant with his tractor, his labor, and his decked out planter is like $22 an acre. Um, it would be really tough to make that pay for itself, especially if he's doing it in a timely manner for you. It'd be really tough to make that pay for yourself if you were to replicate the planter he had with the tech he had, whether that be variety tracking, delta force, you know, all the bells and whistles to give you a perfect stand. Um, it's, it would be really tough to offset that. So if you have somebody that could plant with a decent planter, that's a good place. And then harvesting, trucking, manure spreading, those are the four that, that I would recommend. Um, currently, I, I still outsource my manure and my yeah, manure spreading and all my grain trucking currently. All right, any last questions before we wrap up? But for instance, like rotary hoeing is 12 bucks an acre like you can you can rotary hill a lot for $12 an acre <laughs> so that that's what I look at or like for instance the price of a tractor per acre they don't assign a lot of value to that so if you, you but know it's hard to rent a tractor all year round it is it is yeah cool Adam's gonna stay here for another hour if anybody else wants to just sit here and hang out with Adam <laughs> Thanks for coming.